Recap. Hello. The podcast you're about to listen to is a presentation that I gave to the grade 12 students during our Student Life Day. This day was designed for all students around the idea of empathy. From K to 12, each grade did something different on these terms. For grade 12s, they had the opportunity to sign up to several different workshops that would help support their lifestyle as they go towards university and beyond. Some of the sessions included personal finance, cooking, wellness, and of course, my area, public speaking. If you'd like to follow along the slides, feel free to stop by www.eurekasauce.com, click motivation, and you'll see the video version of this presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Well, welcome to the seminar on public speaking. I'm so happy that uh, you voluntarily chose this seminar. I know a lot of times our ideas of public speaking happen to be negative because we're often forced to do it, get up in front of the class and make a presentation, usually on a topic that the teacher has provided or some other canned approach to presenting that often leaves a little bit of a negative taste in our mouth. If you could leave here today in the 60 minutes I have with you with one idea, that would be to get out and public speak at every opportunity. Public speaking is an underrated tool. It can grow your influence in so many ways, more than you can imagine. Personal communication, whether it's with one person or 5,000, is still the most impactful way to get your idea across. Although social media has taken over on this front, don't deny the fact that there's still lots of opportunity out there to public speak. And throughout this presentation, you'll see that it's not just the polished approach that wins the day. It's really the communication of your ideas and your ability to communicate your idea really pushes the agenda forward. I'm going to show you some not so good presentations, some wonderful ones, and we're going to find some common themes that make presenting, especially public speaking, an effective tool to get your idea across. Public speaking's always been about sharing ideas, either individually or small groups or large massive audiences. And somewhere along the way, maybe the fault of Hollywood and movies, we seem to get confused about sharing our idea and putting on a show. When you have a good idea, the idea will come forward regardless of how you present it. Of course, being able to connect with the audience is a valuable tool, and that's why you're sitting here today. But don't underestimate this idea that what you have to tell someone is far more important than how you say it. And to sit on your ideas and not get up and talk to people about them, not only doesn't it reflect well on you, but you could be missing out on massive opportunities to do good in this world. So throughout today, I want you to pay close attention to the ideas that you have and why bringing them forward is so important. Hey, they may not be the greatest ideas, but in order for you to polish ideas and come up with better ones, you need to get your ideas out into the world. If they get locked up in your head, you just assume they're good or assume they're bad, but you really have no feedback on it. And this is all done in the context of presenting in a short amount of time. I've really structured this seminar around the TED conferences, both the big one and the TEDx conferences, which actually aren't organized by the head organization. The reason is that 
Ted has really nailed down the formula for delivering a talk in a certain amount of time that can inspire, move, and grow any idea that you may have. And this is the kind of world you're going to grow up in where presenting is going to take place. Yes, you need to get out in front of people face to face, but having the audience recorded while you're doing it can also be useful when these videos go on to YouTube and other uh, sources. It actually serves to power the idea even further. Um, And this is strange, but it's true because If you see somebody presenting in front of an audience, you're naturally going to think that they're up there for a very good reason, as opposed to somebody like a talking head on a YouTube channel, or perhaps even this podcast in its context. So seeing other people move uh, crowds is actually a biologically important reason, which you'll find out here in a second. So everything you see today is surrounded by this idea of TED Talks, which have said that In 18 minutes or less, you need to convey your idea and get people to change as a result of it. And of course, there are some amazing ones that do it, and and on the other side of it, some ones who fail miserably. And we're going to look at the characteristics that are common amongst all TED Talks. In order for us to really understand the power of public speaking, We need to recognize its connection with our biology. And there's no better place to do this than taking a look at the Bible. I always get a very big chuckle out of reading the first few paragraphs of Genesis, and especially this particular line. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. I laugh because who on earth was God talking to? Was he talking to another alien race that he had just priorly created? But it sounds like he was creating the universe at the same time. Was he talking to a computer program? The interesting thing is that he did talk. He did say. He didn't do. He just didn't make. He said it into being. And that's an important concept to understand from a psychological perspective, you see humans did write the Bible. God didn't write the Bible. And so they felt when writing this down, that it was important that God said that. And it's interesting because it just shows you way back in our history, how important communication was that it made the first few lines of the Bible. For longer than the internet has been around, or television, or radio, or even writing, human communication has long existed and been the only means of communication of complex ideas. It's obviously one of our strong points over any other animal on the planet, and we've developed important ways to communicate ideas especially detailed ones that require complex thinking. For us in today's seminar, we're going to focus in on this idea of communicating ideas to a local group, a small band. And this happened for thousands of years, ever since humans left East Africa. At nighttime, when there wasn't much to do, because we couldn't wander out into the woods for fear of uh, animals attacking us, We sat around the warmth and protection of the campfire. And during those times, we created our culture as we know it today. Often it was the elders who would stand up and tell stories and lessons to the rest of the tribe. Warriors would explain battles. Mothers would teach about raising children to young mothers. And it was around this campfire that we shared ideas. And the interesting evolutionary perspective is that The ones who could get up and tell the stories in the clearest way often were followed, revered, became powerful, protected, and then were able to pass their genes on down the line. And that's interesting because it shows you that communication of ideas is essentially a biological function, that 
according to the science, you're far more likely to have a person engage in your idea, take your idea and do something with it, or re- have that person resonate uh, the idea that you're trying to portray if they hear it face to face as opposed to over a video. Now, technology has done a great job to really streamline the process, uh, but there's still something happening when you're in an audience and the speaker is able to move you, as we say. And you know it's happening because you get emotional connection. You get warm, fuzzy feelings or sad, and depending on the story, of course. But the bond is much stronger in person than it is in video. Why is it then, if public speaking is such an important tool in our arsenal of communication tactics... Why is it that we're so scared of it? In a recent, recent Atlantic article, they wrote about how teens are protesting in-class presentations and that some schools in the U.S., students have actually walked out because they've been forced to get up in front of the class and talk. And it really begs to the question, well, why is that happening? What are the difficulties with getting up and trying to convey an idea in person rather than through another mean writing, for example. What causes so much stress and anxiety to young people especially? It's an interesting topic, and it comes down to really the vulnerability that happens when we get up in front of people and the chance that we could be humiliated by making a mistake. I mean, these are all ideas that are conjured up in our minds and rarely come true. And as you'll see throughout this seminar, as a matter of fact, just getting up and being authentic and sharing your ideas, regardless if you're, you, you, you're nervous or you're scared of being humiliated, that the ideas are the things that are people are listening to. They're not particularly listening to you. And that's important to remember. And that's what I think we're missing in education today is teaching proper public speaking skills instead of just forcing it on people, assuming that they're willing to do it much in the same way that a human is willing to walk somewhere. The... Protesting of public speaking started with a couple tweets by some teenagers who felt that there was too much anxiety around getting up in front of the class. And it started a Twitter storm with over 400,000 people liking a tweet by one student and over 100,000 comments in in, uh, regards to some of the tweets that these girls had put forward. And... There's something interesting to, to recognize here is that, of course, you're going to be nervous when you get up in front of someone to speak. Nobody that I know of or I've heard of doesn't have some sense of nerves when they get up in front of an audience. There's a lot at stake. And you have the, feel that pressure that pressure to perform. And of course, it's going to cause you to experience symptoms of anxiety. And I'm not discounting that anxiety isn't a real problem for teenagers. Of course it is. It always has been. But for the average person who doesn't have depression or anxiety, those fleeting moments of nervousness before a speech are a good thing, that it's actually preparing your body Uh, to perform well. You see, nervousness and excitement both have the same symptoms physiologically. The increased heart rate, the sweaty palms, the nervousness, the goosebumps, all those things in your stomach. Those are a result of your body preparing you for action. You see, if you jump out of an airplane 
you're both going to be both nervous and excited. And it's very difficult to differentiate those feelings from one another. But when you meet somebody who you're interested in of romantically, you often experience nerves and anxiety, but you don't run away from them. Or maybe you do, but most people don't run away because it's actually excitement that is causing you to experience those symptoms, the potential of the situation. And it's no different from public speaking. I went through some of the comments uh, that were put up by some of the people who responding to these tweets. And one really stuck out in my mind is somebody said, hey, you can type a text message to millions of people on Twitter, but you can't get up in front of a class of 30 and give a three-minute talk on a mountain or some geographical topic. And it's so true. We just assume that the safety of our living rooms allows us to say whatever we want. And this has gotten people into more trouble than it's worth. That getting up in front of people and speaking despite the fact that it's nerve wracking is actually beneficial because number one, you have an audience. Number two, you have an opportunity for dialogue. So any misinterpretation of something can be hashed out in that communication. Whereas online, we assume everyone understands us fully, but it's just not a, a very good tool for interactive dialogue. Since you're going to be nervous, it's really important to figure out what kind of communicator you are. This will help you when it comes time to not only preparing speeches, but delivering speeches. What I did was I found a link, which may seem a little strange to the people listening to the podcast, but on the screen is um, this link to a website that gives you a three-minute test on developing on determining what kind of communicator you are. And it's by no means perfect, but what it is useful for is kind of giving you some insight into how you view communication. Now, typically this is done on a one-to-one -one type analysis, whereas giving communi communication or a speech or something to a massive audience can be slightly different. When I tested, it uh, determined that I was more of a direct communicator, which was a little shocking to me because I felt that I was more of an emotional communicator. So I did uh, use it when I came up with uh, this talk because it allowed me to really dial back on perhaps maybe offering too much uh, authoritarian view. And I mean authoritarian in the sense that me just blabbering on about what I think is right, as opposed to perhaps making the presentation a little bit more interactive. And doing a quiz like this not only gives you some insight, but when it comes time to prepare and practice speeching, speeches, this will help you with your tone and uh, points throughout making where you're going to stand emotionally, uh, what kind of emphasis you're going to uh, put on different ideas throughout the, the speech. And this is something that we're going to see here in a second where I have uh, shown a what I think to be a good and a bad version of a talk. We'll watch them and then we can discuss what that is. I moved here three years ago from New Jersey, um, and I've been playing the violin ever since I was four, which is a pretty long time. Now, I've done everything from orchestras to chamber groups to summer camps, and this summer, when I got home from my camp, I decided that I needed a change, a switch. So I switched teachers based on what my friend told me, who she was also going to, and she told me, it's this guy, his name is Mr. Garnier, and he was a prodigy, and that terrified me because if someone's a prodigy, they expect you to be a prodigy, right? So um, I first went to him and 
he was really nice. I was really surprised. And he told me that we really needed to take it back, take it back to the basics. I needed to relearn a lot of my really easy technique. And I was like, okay, that's fine with me as long as I get better, right? But after five months of doing basic technique, I was bored and I was restless. So I told him and we said, okay, what is our next piece going to be? And I said, Mr. Garnier, I really want to play Scherzo Tarantella by Wieniawski. And he just went, mm-mm, you are not capable of that. And I was extremely upset. I went home and I was angry, but I was determined because I had played this piece before. It was one of my favorites. So all of that week, I worked and I worked. And that next weekend, I said, Mr. Garnier, I have something to show you. So here's what I showed him. Thank <laughs> you. 
So after I played this piece, my teacher just looked at me and he was like, wow, I, I was wrong. You can play it. Yes, you can. And that made me realize a lot of the time people, people, adults, teachers, whoever it is, they underestimate all of the abilities that you have. And you have to believe in yourself in order to show them that yes, yes, you can. Thank you. So the video of uh, the young teenage girl talking about her violin playing overall received tremendously negative feedback. Not that she didn't deliver the speech appropriately, not that her idea was wrong, but that her deliverable was miscued. And by that, I mean... First of all, she appeared really nervous. And nerves are one thing that we'll get to when we get to the, the topic of fear, but that can really put a barrier on the emphasis you need to get it through on your point. What the big concern that I have and other people I'd noted with this particular speech was that it seemed slightly condescending. She had really put her teacher in positive light at the beginning but since he appeared to hold her back, she felt that she could play this, this difficult piece. And she did so in spite of him, rather than perhaps saying that she did it because she was inspired by him. Now, it's probably true that she was a little disappointed that she, her teacher wouldn't teach her this piece. But it's more likely that the teacher wanted to focus in on the fundamentals. Now, we don't know the right answer. However, the whole point of this talk was to inspire people to continue on with their dreams, regardless of barriers. That's a pretty common theme for a speech, especially of uh, somebody young who has got big and large dreams. And so she could have completely put this into a different perspective and even if she didn't have a great relationship with her teacher, she could have used that as a positive enforcer for going ahead to play the piece. She could have said something like, my teacher had me work on the fundamentals and I was so inspired by the fundamentals and I really wanted to just see what I was capable of. So I practiced, practiced, practiced this song and I came to him one day and I said, look what I can do instead of saying he wouldn't let me do it. So I practiced anyway and then I went to show him to spite him. So that's kind of the feedback I had and it really echoed what the comments were on the TED Talk that it wasn't necessarily a poor TED Talk, just probably projected in the wrong way. Now, the whole point of this is to show everyone that you really need to have your ideas come through clearly in order to motivate the audience. Because for me, I wasn't inspired by the talk at all. Uh, I just kind of observed it. I don't know much about violin playing. Apparently, it wasn't that great of a job. But I really didn't, it didn't compel me to do anything. And to grab hold of the audience, you need to kind of have this generic idea that you use your experience in order to motivate the people to either move or do something or change their behavior. And so by kind of making it more in a positive light, I think she would have captured the audience a lot more effectively. How do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. 
and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day, why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight, and the Wright brothers beat them to it. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery, and this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Well, Simon, of course, is a master public speaker, and he is an experienced marketer and adult. So he does have an advantage over... Cassie's speech. However, one thing that you do notice is that he's not nervous, which is a result of him not being scared of public speaking, but being well practiced. And by being well practiced, you can see that he's emphasizing specific points in order to captivate the audience, in order to motivate the audience to do something. And that's what makes this speech so powerful. This particular TED Talk actually launched his career into space. Um, and it's done in the exact same idea that Cassie was trying to say. That you need to figure out why you're doing something. Cassie's idea was, hey, you are playing the violin because you want to play these wonderful songs. That's your why. And Simon's was more general. And by being more general, he was able to really pull the audience in and have the audience start questioning themselves. And the idea flowed throughout the entire talk, and it was obvious from the beginning right to the end, even though he started with a bunch of questions. By starting with a bunch of questions, it almost got you to start to question yourself. You didn't just answer the questions he was asking. You were trying to think, hey, what's the point of this talk? But even more deeper... What am I doing? Why are these things happening? Why is Martin Luther King such an a, a, a enigma and such a powerful speaker? So it was well done. Uh, this is why I have an important activity for you to do in regards to making you a better public speaker. And you'll have to stick with me for a minute as I explain it. But the whole idea is that in order for you to kind of have these ideas grow to the point where you would be confident enough to get in front of people to express them, that you need to kind of have a grounding, a framework in order to make that more uh, valuable to you. Because we all have ideas. Every single human being has an idea. And every single human being wants to share their ideas. Maybe it's in the light of getting rich. Maybe it's the idea of making a difference. Maybe, maybe fame. Who knows? But we all have ideas. And in order for us to really get a handle on the understanding if our idea is valuable or not, is to really take a look at ourselves. 
And so what we're going to do now is we're going to spend a couple of minutes and you're going to write a two, three, four, five line max bio of yourself. And the bio is going to help you figure out not just what kind of communicator you are, but what kind of value that you can bring forth into the world, what you can attach to the ideas that you have that will really supercharge them, that will really motivate people to do or act or lead whatever you need them to do. So before you get started, I want to show you an example of mine. Uh, and I have two bios. They're essentially the same bio. One's on the Apple website and one's on the HTS website. But as you read through them, you're going to notice one thing. I'm not giving a mundane, somewhat detailed version of my life. What I'm trying to do is create excitement around who I am, create excitement around my brand. And I'd use words that aren't common, that are very descriptive. For example, in my last paragraph, I said, in his spare time, you can find him shagging fly balls, stopping pucks, or clanging and banging in the gym. His blog, EurekaSauce.com, holds his axioms on living the best life possible. I really think that last paragraph, I spent a ton of time writing it, uh, was powerful enough to not give details that are boring about my life, but rather give people an idea of what I stand for, what my brand is. So you can see talking about baseball and hockey and going to the gym. So there's this fitness aspect of it. EurekaSauce.com is a little marketing pitch for my, my um, blog, but it's about living the best life possible. So maybe I'm hoping that people will read that and go, okay, this guy's into like, you know, fitness and living well. And that's something that I want to learn more about. And therefore I will follow him or I will take that next step. More importantly, what the bio does for you is that when you go out into the world and you start talking to people, whether or not they read your biography, whether they not, whether or not they even care about your biography, that you're projecting what your biography says. So if you can write down in four or five lines what you mean to the world and what you stand for in the world, and then you're going to go out into the world and when you have conversations, when you get up in public speak, you're going to have that confidence because you know what you stand for. This isn't written in stone. This isn't the Ten Commandments. It can constantly change. And I encourage you to constantly change it. I encourage you to write this down, fold it up, put it into your sock drawer, and literally in a year later, come back and take a look at it. For many of you, you're going to go into university. You're going to meet so many more people. You're going to change your views on things because you're going to be exposed to different kinds of people. These are good things. And that's why it's constantly important to reevaluate where you stand in the world. But you can't do it if you don't have anything written down. It's, it's not even the same as having it in your head. To physically look at it triggers different pathways in your neurology, which is going to allow you to think much deeper on these topics of who you are and what you stand for. And have you, if you constantly revise it, you're only going to get a better view of yourself, which is going to give you a clear indication of what you stand for in the world. All right, now you know a little bit about yourself. We're time for the most interesting part of public speaking, the fear. That's right. Uh, the common knowledge is that more people fear public speaking than they do death. Of course, that's not true. It would be strange if, you, if it was. But public speaking is certainly one of those things that is generally terrifying to everyone. Now, whether or not you're triggered by it, like the girls who put up the Twitter feed on forcing people to public speak, or whether you're just scared of getting up in front of people because you may fail, uh, are, are essentially the same things that are acting in your brain. Being scared is a good thing. 
and and there's no better way to uh, explain fear than to look at it from the perspective of someone who has no fear. That's right, he may be fictional, but he's got a powerful message here. A man with nothing to fear is a man with nothing to love. That's what the Joker said in the Dark Knight series. And I think it's completely true because love and fear, well, most people think that they're opposite on the emotional spectrum. They're actually not. To love somebody is to fear all the time for their safety, for their well-being, for them, vice versa. To be scared is to mean that you actually care. To get up in front of people and speak is to mean that you're there to say something because you actually care about it. And this is an important understanding. If you're going to go out and share your ideas, you're going to open yourself up to criticism. You're going to open yourself up to a lot of people having opinions that may not reflect the same ones that you have. We do this all the time online, but we do it because we feel like we're protected. Realistically, online communication is very, very dangerous, and that's a topic for another podcast. But having to look someone in the eyes and say something, whether it's controversial or not, whether you believe in it or not, whether it's close to you or not, is far more powerful because you can see on those people's faces whether or not what you're saying is resonating with them. And this is true in any size audience. Before we can figure out how to conquer fear, you've really got to figure out where the fear is coming from. This is a slide that shows three zones, and this is a common activity in team building events or communication events. But what it does is it, it shows where you stand on certain issues. In this particular case, when it comes to public speaking, we often find ourselves in the uh, alarm zone when in fact we should be in the discomfort zone. Very few people can be successful public speaking in the comfort zone. And here's why. When you're comfortable with something, you're confident. And confidence can be a good thing, but it can also blind you to things that may come up unexpectedly that you might not realize is coming down the road. Uh, Maybe you have a change in the venue where you're going to public speak. Maybe you have a problem with the technology or your slides. And if you're too comfortable, you're not alert enough to really recognize the power of the nervous system when it's activated. So what you want to do is you want to kind of work your way into the discomfort zone. But it's tricky because the alarm zone is mostly our default when it comes to being scared. When you're walking through the woods and you hear a branch click and it's the middle of the night, you automatically go to the alarm zone. There isn't too many people who believe that They can be completely comfortable alone in the woods at night to hear a branch click and say, "Mm, it's probably just a bunny rabbit. We are not biologically wired that way. The reason is that we have to activate our fight, flight, or freeze systems very, very quickly. And the faster we can access those, the faster we can get out of dangerous situations. That's why we think there's monsters under our bed when we hear a noise. It's so that we can live to fight or run another day. So how do you get into the discomfort zone? Well, first of all, you have to recognize that there are two zones that you could be in to which you're not. So if you realize that you're comfortable, 
you might want to start thinking of why that is. Why am I so confident in this speech? What could go wrong? Maybe make a list of things. Typically, most people can't do this. Most people are in the alarm zone. So what happens if you're in the alarm zone? Well, physiologically, you'll notice a few things. You'll notice that your hands start to sweat. You'll notice that your heart starts beating. Your breathing becomes more shallow. Your eyes, your pupils dilate. You take in more of the world visually. Same with your ears. You seem to improve your sense of smell and your uh, ability to hear things. Again, this is a fight, flight, or freeze response that have been genetically hardwired into us through thousands of years of evolution. If you understand and you have the ability to recognize that you are in the alarm zone before you step on stage or before you communicate with someone, it is only going to serve you better because you will be able to move into the discomfort zone while still activated in this sort of fight, flight, or freeze phase. And by that, I mean you'll be able to take deeper breaths, to calm yourself down, to understand that being nervous is okay. And by doing this, it will help you. It will help you because you'll be able to recognize that being nervous allows you to be in a more heightened state, which is going to allow you to deliver a better speech, especially if you're prepared. This slide, and for those who are listening, is a picture of all of the systems that are activated when you're in fight, flight, or freeze mode because it is a complex system. And all of these things serve to make you more alert and heightened. And by doing that, you are better prepared to act. Now, the interesting thing that people don't realize is that Excitement and fear activate the same pathways in the body. If you're about to jump out of an airplane, you are going to be both scared and excited, I assume, because you're going to go skydiving to get that rush. But it's also going to trigger your fear. And so in situations like skydiving, we often can't recognize the difference between the two. But indeed, both systems are activated. When you're excited, you get sweaty palms, a faster heart rate, you breathe uh, more shallowly, and your eyes and ears and nose are all in a heightened awareness. That's why when you see somebody who you find attractive, you also activate those same systems. And that's neat because you understand if someone, if you're attracted to someone to have those systems activated, it's going to make you in a better state to communicate, better state to engage with that person. Whereas if you're in that comfort zone and you meet someone whom you're attracted to, not only is it going to be a turnoff to them because you'll, they'll probably assume that you're not interested, but secondly, you may miss some signals from that person. So being scared is actually a really, really, really good thing to be. And people do everything they can to avoid it, much like they do everything they can to avoid stress. These things have been carefully engineered over through evolution to make us better human beings. And the more comfortable we get as a society, the less we use them. And the less we use them, the less we really understand them and the less we recognize when we're in those states. So I invite you to really spend some time thinking about how you're feeling the next time you feel excited or scared and how you might be able to control that. Of course, it's easier said than done. Of course that is. But the more you practice it, the better you get at it. The better you get at it, the more that you can use it to your advantage. This is one of my all-time favorite pictures, and again, for those listening, this is a famous piece of art. The original, I believe, was lost, but it uh, comes from Holland or Belgium, and it's called The Fall of Icarus, and you really have to 
Google it to really understand what it's trying to say. But if you look at this picture at a glance, you might not notice anything in particular. You'll see a ship entering a harbor, a very looks like in the distance a city that's thriving, a farmer and a plow using his plow. Uh, there's a shepherd who's staring up at the trees, and there's even a fisherman in the bottom right corner. It looks quite normal. But the interesting thing is that if you look carefully enough, you'll see Icarus falling into the ocean. And Icarus, the story, which I've had a podcast on, is the result of Icarus flying too high and the wax on his feathers melted and he fell into the sea. And this art, art painting, painting of art, really wants to show you what it means to be scared in the world. And that may seem like a stretch from a simple painting, but the whole point of this is to show you that when you fail, if you get up in public speak and you make a fool out of yourself, that at the end of the day, nobody's really going to care. Not because they don't want to care, but that they're too busy in their lives to notice. And you have for sure experienced this. When you've made a fool out of yourself and perhaps you've had one or two snide comments about it, but within a week, within a, a year, 10 years, nobody will remember except you. And the reason is people have their own problems. People have their own worries. People are worried about failing themselves. And so to assume that everyone around you is watching you fail is a complete lie. Not because people out there don't want you to fail. That's just simply not true. Not because people don't care that you fail. That's not true. It's because that they can't focus their attention too long on your failures because they're worried about their own failures. I have this painting hanging up in my basement and I look at it every day because when I go out into the world, when I start my day by working out and going out into the world... I want to consciously be aware of the fact that if I fail, it's going to be okay. And what that helps me do is take a little more risk when either I meet a new person, stop to talk and engage them a little bit more and not worried about what they think of me. Uh, when I approach a difficult task, maybe I'm going to do this and I'm not going to do it well, but that's okay. I've learned something from it. And I invite you to look at this picture often because I, it will help as much as it helped me. The last thing we're going to talk about when it comes to the technicality of public speaking is stage presence. This is by far one of the most popular ways in modern times to share your ideas, uh, both good and bad, because when used inappropriately, uh, you can really tap into the power of communication. And we'll go through some examples that show the good and the bad of having a great stage presence. Okay, first up is this idea that public speaking isn't acting. And I know I mentioned it earlier, but I just want to go back and reinforce it. You see, when you're acting, you are pretending to be someone else. Whereas when you're public speaking, people are there to listen to you because you are you, not someone else. And so it's really important to make that distinction because a lot of people get up and assume that when they're speaking in front of an audience that they need to put on a show, that they need to be someone else. And by doing that, you're discrediting yourself, first of all, but you're also really taking away from the authenticity of your idea. I'm assuming that the ideas that you're sharing are your own and therefore should be provided and presented by you and not some character in a play or a scene. 
This isn't to take away from acting. Acting and plays and theater and movies are wonderful things that entertain us, but they are very, very different from trying to share your ideas in front of an audience. Of course, history is littered with all kinds of powerful speeches. And I really enjoy sharing Abraham Lincoln in particular because a lot of people don't realize that when Abraham Lincoln was giving speeches, especially when he was leading up to his uh, election, his first presidential election, he would debate for hours at a time and get up in front of audiences and deliver two to three hour long speeches that even had breaks in them. And this is something that's important to recognize because back then there was no TV and radio. And so your attention span was a lot longer than it is for today. And it forced you to really sit and think throughout the speeches that we weren't really looking for tidbits or sound bites or something that will resonate. Instead, we were trying to embrace the entire message. This is an idea that has almost essentially been completely lost in today's modern world, for good and bad. Obviously, nobody has the time anymore to sit for three hours and listen to speeches. Uh, but of course, the internet has allowed us to produce long form speeches where people can just review them again. And so like you're doing now with this video or this podcast, you can always go back over it. Whereas back then you were there, you were invested and you needed to listen attentively. And this is what Lincoln was a master at moving masses, sharing ideas. And of course the rest is history. Modern times are slightly different. Donald Trump has been a strange addition to the public speaking world when it comes to politics because he doesn't toe the line of tradition where his speeches are well prepared with key messages, very polished and practiced. Instead, when you watch his speeches, you will notice that he purposely tells the audience that he doesn't have any notes that he purposely is speaking from the heart. He'll often repeat himself in very short sentences, and he'll do this in a sort of a stumbling fashion. Things like make America great again, bring back jobs to America, constant repeating, you know, boasting that he doesn't have notes. What that does is it actually plays to his political base. They, the, his political base wants people uh, as leaders who are leading with their heart first. And, and this does a great job. And so in some ways, Donald Trump is a master public speaker because he's able to carry an audience without notes, which in itself is a great feat, but move people as well. So he knows how to play his audience. And so regardless of what you think of him, you have to consider that his speeches are definitely in the right place for his audience. And you'll notice in the next slide, especially too, the similarities between this idea of presence in, in, in front of people and how it plays out. You see, Donald Trump, when he gives these speeches, you, he uses a stage. He's often standing in the middle with people in front and back beside him, big American flags everywhere. It almost turns into like a Hollywood spectacle at times. This isn't a very new strategy. This has been used for a millennia, uh, probably most famously in Nazi Germany. The Nazis undoubtedly had this propaganda of public speaking down to an art you can see in the photo if you're watching or if you're listening they have this huge grand stage with this massive eagle and the, the obviously the nazi symbol and there's tiers as in levels to a hierarchy where hitler stood at the front you've got the famous uh, nazi salute in there 
And so even before the speech began, it set itself up to be a grand spectacle. And Hitler, like Trump, would often diverge from his notes and go on tangents for very long lengths of time, not as long as Lincoln, but he would always come back to this idea of a nation state and he was able to get the people to rally around his idea by repeating similar phrases. And this really stirs up this kind of groupthink, which the Nazis mastered at the time better than anyone else. And a lot of debate has been had over whether or not this alone was the reason that Nazi Germany was able to sway good, reasonable people in their ways of death and destruction. Propaganda is a powerful thing, and it's often led by face-to-face communication. Hear that? That's nothing. Which is what I, as a speaker at today's conference, have for you all. I have nothing. Nada. Zip. Zilch. Zippo. Nothing smart. Nothing inspirational. Nothing even remotely researched at all. I have absolutely nothing to say whatsoever. And yet, through my manner of speaking, I will make it seem like I do. (laughs) Like what I am saying is brilliant. And maybe, just maybe, you will feel like you've learned something. Now, I'm going to get started with the opening. I'm going to make a lot of hand gestures. I'm going to do this with my right hand. I'm going to do this with my left. I'm going to adjust my glasses. And then I'm going to ask you all a question. Uh, By show of hands, how many of you all have been asked a question before? Okay, great, I'm seeing some hands. And again, I have nothing here. (laughs) Now, I'm going to react to that and act like I'm telling you a personal anecdote. Something to break the tension. Something to endear myself a little bit. (laughs) Something kind of uh, embarrassing. (laughs) And you guys are going to make an awe sound. It's true. It really happened. (laughs) And now I'm going to bring it to a broader point. I'm going to reel you back in. I'm going to make it intellectual. I'm going to bring it to this man right here. Now, what this man did was important, I'm sure. But I, for one, have no idea who he is. I simply Google image the word scientist. And now, you see, I'd like it to seem like I'm making points, building an argument, inspiring you to change your life, when in reality, this is just me buying time. Now, if you don't believe me, let's take a look at the numbers. This is a real thing that's happening right now. (laughs) The number of talks that I'm giving is one. (laughs) Interesting facts imparted thus far in said talk, well, that's going to be a zero. (laughs) My height in inches is 70.5. Note the point five there. Two times six equals 12. And then interestingly enough, six times two also equals 12. That's math. (laughs) 352 is a three-digit number. One, two, three, four, five, and then almost immediately following that, we get six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> now, to add more filler here, I'm going to give you a couple more numbers to consider. Uh, 18, 237, 5,601, 2.6 million, 4, 4, 24, staggering. These are real numbers, all of them. And to follow that up, let's take a look at some graphs. Now, if you take a look at this pie chart, what you're going to see is that the majority far exceeds the minority. Everybody see that? Cool, isn't it? And let's take a look at this bar graph, because it shows similarly irrelevant data. Now, I'm doing this because I'd like to make it seem like I've done my homework. If you were, say, watching this on YouTube with the sound off, you might think, huh, okay. This guy knows what he's talking about. But I don't. I'm floundering, panicking, I've got nothing. I'm a total and utter phony. But you know what? I was offered a TED Talk. And damn it, I'm going to see it through. (laughs) Now, if you take a look behind me, these are just words paired with vaguely thought-provoking stock photos. 
I'm going to point at them like I'm making use both of my time as well as your time, but in reality, I don't know what half of them mean. And now, as these continue, I'm just going to start saying gibberish. Wagga wa, gabba gabba, turkey, mouth in a mouth, chip, trip, my dog skip, rip it and dip it, Richard. I'm an itty bitty baby bopper, and I'm hungry in my tum tum. Brad Pitt, Uma Thurman. Names, things, words, words, and more things. And see, it feels like it might make sense, doesn't it? Like maybe, just maybe, I'm building to some sort of satisfying conclusion. I mean, I'm gesticulating as though I am. I'm pacing, I'm growing in intensity, I'm taking off my glasses, which, by the way, are just frames. I wore them to look smart, even though my vision is perfect. <laughs> and now I'm going to slow things down a little bit. I'm going to change the tone. I'm going to make it seem like I'm building to a moment. And what if I was? <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? What can you do? Life's a roller coaster. You know, <laughs> if there's one thing you take away from my talk, I'd like you to think about what you heard at the beginning, and I'd like you to think about what you hear now. Because it was nothing, and it's still nothing. Think about that. <laughs> Or don't, that's fine. And now I'm going to stop talking. Thank you. What's absolutely fantastic about that video you just watched is that he literally says nothing. And I didn't introduce it purposely because I wanted you to have a fresh take on what his message is. His, his entire TED Talk is done with the use of presence alone. It doesn't have any ideas. But strangely, and I suppose funnily enough, it makes sense. The gestures he's using and the tones and pitches mimic what almost every good TED Talk has. And what this tells us is that there is a formula to it. And the formula has been polished, especially by TED. However, what's missing is the idea. And so if you, at the very minimum, insert your idea into this presence formula that the speaker has just delivered you're at least guaranteed to have somebody in the audience wait. But if you want to take it a step further and you consider people like Tony Robbins, he combines the stage presence of, say, Donald Trump with a message that resonates with people. And he also adds in the spectacle of fireworks and long-form discussions, which kind of wraps everything up. And Tony Robbins is a, is a master at it. He's made millions of dollars off of simple messages like, we're slave to our emotions. And of course, he's got a great idea backing it up, and people believe it. And he hasn't gone away for many, many years, even though people on the margins and on the fringes think that he's a bit of a phony, because people, when they're in front of him during his presentations, fully believe it. And I am a Tony Robbins fan, for that reason alone, that his simple messages, they work. When you sit there and you listen to what he's saying, it forces you to, to believe in not only what he's saying, but to believe in yourself. And this changes people's lives. And at the end of the day, if we're all in this together, and we all want be, uh, to be better people, and if Tony Robbins can do it, then why not? I'm going to end my talk here. If there's one thing that I want you to take away from this talk is that you need to get out and public speak at every opportunity. The message hasn't changed. The whole point of this is to build your influence and build your influence in a good way. People need to be inspired. Even in today's world of short attention spans, polarization on the internet. People want inspiration. 
and you can see this very, very carefully being played out, not so much on the engi- on the fringes anymore, but people like Jordan Peterson, who appeared out of nowhere to inspire hundreds of thousands of people to change their lives. People want it. They need it. And they want to hear your ideas. And the more you share your ideas, the better you'll get at developing them. But if you never share them, they get stuck in your head and you're self-defeating them already. Maybe you think your idea is great, but you don't want to share it because it'll be really ridiculed. Don't look at it that way. Face your fears. We've talked a lot about that. Putting yourself out there is only going to make your ideas better. Even if someone immediately shuts down your idea. Remember the story of Icarus falling into the water. It will long be forgotten. You can take what you've learned and change it for the better. The more you do it, the better you'll become. Good luck out there, and thank you very much for listening.